Okay, so the uh, the conversation uh, that we uh, we just heard from let me get my notes uh, from Dr. Zubrin uh, provided uh, you know some really alarming, concerning uh, instances of you know the drop in technical education in the U.S., uh, the spending on, vi on, on vendors versus a vision-fueled uh, approach to, uh, to spending on, uh, on space and exploration. Uh, and so um, Zach mentioned this to me. 50 years ago, President Nixon made the longest distance phone call ever from the Oval Office to the moon. Uh, today, could you imagine Trump calling Mars? Uh, not, not really. Uh, and so the optimism of the 1960s imagined that soon we'd be undertaking trips to Mars, vacations in space, and have energy too cheap to meter. Uh, so, you know, people like Tyler Cowen, uh, Tyler Cowen uh, has suggested a cycle of stagnation. Uh, but, you know, we are streaming this event to almost anywhere in the world. Uh, you have had, um, you know, innovations in artificial intelligence. I could, you know, uh, get a sandwich delivered to me here uh, with little effort on my end uh, in, uh, in a matter of minutes. Um, so let's have a quick discussion about the overall debate. Uh, are we stagnating uh, or are we not? Uh, Tamara, should we start with you? Uh, just make sure you click it up. Okay. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So I focus on governance specifically. So I'm always thinking about uh, what does what does innovation look like from the governance side. And so one way that you can take a temperature check is by thinking about state capacity. And of course, state capacity refers to just generally the ability of your state to um, effectively administer its territory. And so that means things like can you offer public goods? Do you have a monopoly on uh, the use of force and violence in your society? But if you take that one level up, another way to think about state capacity is your ability to initiate, coordinate, and execute on long-scale projects that require um, unusual amounts of coordination. And so if you think about this, the, the, um, the seminal example of this, of course, is the Apollo program. And when I think about the most recent program of this scope, of this nature, I was eight years old. It was in 2003. Does anyone have an idea of what like that last big project uh, was? Okay, the Human Genome Project. That's the last thing I can think of of that scale. And so that was the last time we were able to accomplish something that required long-scale coordination of different agencies, um, a, a pretty big capital expenditure. And so the question is, can we still do that? And um, I'm not sure the answer is yes just right now. Right? So um, China says they're going to go to the far side of the moon. They do it. Mike Pence says, we're going to go back to the moon in five years, and nobody believes him. And so uh, I'm really concerned with, with the governance aspect of all of this. Eli? Uh, yeah, I think it's unquestionable that, that we have uh, stagnated over the last few decades. Um, it, and I, I like to, you know, of course, I'm in aerospace, so I like to look at, at aerospace as an example. But if you think about uh, 1903, the Wright brothers have their first flight. Within uh, just a little over a decade, there's commercial service. Uh, you know, uh, a couple decades later, there's international service. Uh, you can get, you know, from you know, on Pan Am, on the China Clipper, you can get from San Francisco to Hong Kong for the first time in six days. Right, uh, and then and then jets come along in the 19, late 1950s, and and you can basically fly at the same speeds we're flying at today in the 1950s, and then when you, you see Concorde has its first flight in 1969, and so you, you and and of course that's the same year as the Apollo moon landing, right? Today, if you want to see a, a Concorde, you have to go to a museum, um, and if you want to see a, a, a moon lander, you have to go to a museum. Um, there are uh, so we've gone from, you know, over a very short period of time, 50 something years, we've, we've gotten to, we, we got to where we are, and then we've basically stagnated uh, in the last 50 years in aerospace. Uh, and, and, and stagnated, you know, not complete stagnation, we've, we've seen costs come down and we've seen uh, frequencies go up and, and, and a lot of other things. But um, it, it's not the future that we thought we were going to have. Um, and, and looking at science fiction is a good way, uh, 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 you know, a, a barometer of, of how we're doing. Uh, you know, if you look at 2001: A Space Odyssey, uh, they expected uh, Pan Am to have service to space in in 2001, right? And that was a movie from 1968. So, um, 
so so at least it, you know it, in aerospace I, I think it's it's unquestionably stagnated and and more broadly i mean if you think about something like um eisenhower's like interstate highway program like does anybody think we could do that today I don't. I mean, like that's. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think we 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 will do it. Um, and not that I'm not for it, but I, I just don't think we will. So, um, so I think it's a, a unquestionably um, we have stagnated. I, I, I am optimistic about the future. I think that there is um, a lot of potential to um, to end the stagnation. But um, but I think Tyler's right. It's it's for, for the last few decades. It's it's been it's been grim. What are your thoughts, James? Uh, <clears throat> Check one two. Uh, right. So you know, Tyler's a, a smart guy. I'm a, uh, a doctor of political theory. So right now, I'm spending a lot of time uh, reading Marshall McLuhan and Aristotle and thinking about how uh, technology changes our social and psychological environment in a way that then forms us in new and different ways. Uh, so I think there's a there's a risk when talking about stagnation of thinking about technological advancement in sort of incremental and cumulative terms. Uh, whereas, you know, what we're experiencing right now is a massive shift from electric technology, specifically televisual electric technology, to digital technology. And the character of that shift is one that fundamentally changes the way our social and psychological environment is formed, the way that we perceive reality and then respond to reality. So we're shaping our tools, right? And our tools are also shaping us. And in some ways, the stagnation that we're seeing, I would attribute to, you know, for instance, during the electric age, during the televisual age, um, progress, uh, change, um, utopian thinking, right? Um, were driven by fantasy. It was if you can dream it, you can do it, and whoever dreams the biggest can do the most. Um, and the ethos of the Imagineer, as they said at Disney, or of, you know, Mad Men, um, uh, was all about figuring out how to monetize fantasy and use that sort of experience to drive um, progress or advancement. Uh, then digital comes along and democratizes fantasy, right? Everyone can be their own TV channel. Everyone can have their own crazy ideas and just like spew them forth into the world, right? Um, and what happened was we all sort of began to perceive that the value of our fantasies was dropping, sometimes very quickly. So the good news is, you know, I, I've played music for a long time. I've had bands. Garage Band came out, and I thought, yeah, at last, I don't need to go into a studio and drop ten grand, and uh, you know, I can just sit in front of my iMac and make a record instead of studying for comps or whatever. Um, well, so did everyone else. And so we all know now that there's just been this content tsunami in almost every area of life. And the, the triviality of content is becoming this overwhelming experience. And we all know that even the best stuff, you know, whether it's like a Taylor Swift record or like a very good white paper or like whatever, it's all going to get plowed under. And only the computers will remember <clears throat> all of the things that have happened. And we will forget. Um, that's very disenchanting, right? That is an experience where we perceive that fantasy doesn't really have the juice anymore to drive advancement and progress in the way that it used to under electric conditions. Uh, and the way that we're sort of grappling with that, I think, you know, and we'll, we'll be talking about this later when it comes to, you know, interplanetary stuff. I think the infrastructure thing is also sort of in the mix. Um, but you know, just because we're experiencing <clears throat> stagnation doesn't mean that you know, there's something wrong with us. I think we need to recognize that some kinds of innovation under digital conditions are going to create tremendous change and have the potential for massive advancement. But they might not necessarily serve like recognizably human ends, you know, like social credit. Is that, is that is that good? Is that is that progress? Um, those are interesting questions, and you know, and I think when we broach the subject of stagnation, uh, if we're honest <clears throat> and if we're thinking clearly about this massive change in the character of our technology, um, obsolescing the televisual and really accelerating the digital, then we'll start getting roped into these deeper conversations. 
So Eli, you are uh, now at Boom Supersonic. So tell us a little bit about what you're focused on and you know why Supersonic, uh, why that as uh, a focus of, of your work now is so important to the future from your perspective and what type of signal does it send? Sure. <clears throat> So at, at Boom, our, our mission is to eliminate the barriers to experiencing the planet. So, uh, you know, the, there's basically, you know, three reasons why you haven't been somewhere on the planet that you want to go to, and that's time, money, and hassle, right? Uh, and if we can get rid of uh, those those barriers, you can go anywhere you want, um, and, and and you will. Um, so we are we are tackling that first by uh, by bringing, uh, developing and building and, and entering into service a supersonic airliner that's going to go, it's called Overture. It's going to go uh, Mach 2.2. And, uh, you know, it'll be in service in the mid-2020s. Um, so, so that's what we're doing. Um, and um, you know, why does it matter? Um, I think... I think it's it's easy to to look at it from uh, again a historical perspective. If you look at you know what happened when we went from propeller aircraft to jet aircraft, uh, all of a sudden you saw the world get uh, knit together in, in, a, in a much more uh, much closer way. You saw uh, a trade uh, increase. You saw uh, exchange of ideas increase. Um, you saw. Uh, a, uh, tr people, people being able to to um, visit other countries uh, and and experience new new cultures uh, in, in a in a brand new way, um, and it, it it wasn't just about saving time on airplanes, right? So so this is this is a this is a I think a myth that that takes people a while to to overcome when you start thinking about supersonic planes. Uh, when we went from props to jets, it didn't just save people a few hours on their cross-country flight, right? They, they actually ended up spending more time on planes uh, in the jet age than they did in the propeller age because the flight was faster and therefore they went more often. So it's, it's, it's about actually closeness, I think, um, and, and, that, and that's why it matters. And it's also not just about where you can go, it's about what can come to you. Right, so so the Beatles uh, world tour in 1964, like could not have happened a decade earlier without jet aircraft. Um, you know, a uh, uh, sports. Um, you know, so the so jet aircraft entered service in 1958. In 1959, the Brooklyn Dodgers moved to L.A. Like you couldn't have had a national sports, a truly national sports league, um, without without the jet. So I I think that there's going to be countless second order benefits from from supersonics and you know maybe we'll see a NBA team in, in Shanghai and an NFL team in London finally um, when when uh, uh, supersonic uh, aircraft enter service I think but I, th I think it's just it's gonna it's gonna change everything and and we've just forgotten because uh, most of us have not had a speed up in our lifetime mm -hmm. uh, of, of what you can do I think we've forgotten what that will actually do for the world and how that will actually change the world. So really quickly, can you just give an overview of the regulatory journey with, with Supersonic, and then I'm going to lead to a question uh, about what Innovative Governance is doing, but sort of what, what has that been like? The, the, re the regulatory side? So I think we've had... Um We've had a, a, a pretty good reception from regulators, you know, especially here in the U.S. Um, I think... Um, so, so I mean, our, our regulatory issues. Of course, uh, supersonic flight is banned over the U.S. and many other countries. So, so that's not an issue for Boom. Uh, we we are um, for the you know for for service. We're, we're talking about doing transoceanic uh, supersonic flight. So, so you know, think uh, New York to London in three hours and fifteen minutes, and San Francisco to Tokyo in five and a half hours, uh, gate to gate. Uh, so, so, so that's not that's not a concern. We we do have uh, regulatory needs in terms of standards that don't exist. That we um, so there's a law that says we have to be certified for noise uh, for landing and takeoff noise, but there is no standard that exists for it. So, you know, we need the government to 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 make a standard. Um, but what what I've found, um, it, I I think that Silicon Valley uh, overrates regulatory risk. Um, I, I think there, so. So when 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 founders or when when VC thinks about 
uh, Washington, D.C., I, I think they, they think, oh, this is just this scary black box that I don't know anything about, and therefore I, I put giant error bars on the, on the risk um, level, and, and, and a lot of times they don't invest. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's smart to divide it out into political risk and regulatory risk, all right? And so political risk is, is relevant if you're, you know, making something that's, that's you know, politically controversial, like uh, Uber for abortions or something like that. Like, you're going to have, like, you're going to have, um, you know, a, a political uh, battle over that. And that, that is risky. But if, if you have something that, that everybody agrees, like, should exist, mm -hmm. the regulatory risk is really minimal because... The regulators, you know, especially at the top of these agencies, like they're, they're, the bottleneck is their attention, mm -hmm. it, it, and, and and all you have to do, I think, is is build, build the product, and then then you cause sort of cause the crisis that gets their attention that 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 leads to a resolution, and they're going to do the right thing. So um, so, I I think it's been uh, I think it's been very positive, and. Um, I think it's a very different dynamic than I think a lot of people in, in, in the VC community are thinking about in terms of, of regulation. So, uh, Tamara, um, you know, Dr. Zubrin mentioned uh, NASA spending $36 billion, uh, SpaceX spending $1 billion. Talk about what innovative governance is focused on. What does that mean? Sort of unpack some of the work that you all are focused on right now. Yeah, so I work at the Center for Innovative Governance. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Okay, I can't hear myself. Um, I work at the Center for Innovative Governance Research, and we are a nonprofit based here in Washington, D.C., and we work to build the ecosystem for charter cities. And so charter cities, the idea was first popularized by uh, the most recent Nobel Economics Laureate, Paul Romer. They're new city developments granted a special jurisdiction that allow them to adopt the best practices in commercial law. This is really important because uh, we know that in the long run, probably the single most important uh, determinant of your country's economic trajectory is going to be its quality of governance. Um, so you, places where I was born, or the place where I was born, Nigeria, has the most oil in Africa. Um, it has like one of the sharpest populaces in Africa, and yet it persists in uh, just kind of going nowhere really quickly. And then you have a place like Shenzhen, on the other hand, which in 1980 was a poor fishing village, right? Um, there were 30,000 people who lived there. And then within a few decades, it becomes the humanitarian miracle of basically the entire world, right? Um, Shenzhen ends up piloting a market in labor. They pilot a market in land. They um, introduce labor contracts for the very first time in China's history. And then they also open up uh, state-owned uh, enterprises to other investors, outside investors for the first time. And all of those reforms end up trickling up to the national level. So Shenzhen was one of four special economic zones that was declared um, by China in 1980. And it ends up, again, kind of being the humanitarian miracle of history. Um, and then you have a place like Dubai, which in 2004 decided they wanted to become a center of international finance. So they end up importing common law. They literally bring a British judge into Dubai. And today, Dubai is a top 15 place in the world to do business. So we want to apply these lessons to um, low and middle income countries to literally import good institutions. There are other things that that entails, right, norms and, and those sorts of things, to lift on a like, conservative estimate, tens of millions of people out of poverty. And so uh, we partner with new city developments, governments, economists, entrepreneurs, and multilateral institutions to, one, create a shared framework of understanding of what a charter city is, and two, to build teams and that can actually execute on the ground. So our first project is in Zambia, um, and that's a great place to start because most of you probably don't know much about Zambia, and in an African context, that's a very good thing. Um, because if you do know something, it's probably negative. And so um, that city we're working with is called Nkwa it's 30 minutes outside of Lusaka, the capital of Zambia. And uh, when completed, it will feature 100,000 residents. It will have an industrial park, a um, business district, and the kind of centerpiece of the city is going to be a university. And so we're really excited about that and hopefully getting the MOU signed uh, this June. So that's where we're starting. And then um, looking at Honduras as well and hoping to move all around the world. So James, I want to come to you and talk about Grand Ideas, your, your paper uh, arguing for uh, space exploration uh, uh, in order to push back on rising nihilism and anti-human malaise. Uh, but would love a thought from each of you on you know, the big ideas that you're trying to do in government, uh, the big ideas that you're trying to execute uh, in the private sector. Where are, where's the best place for big ideas right now? Is it possible uh, to, to see big ideas really happen in places like the US? You talked about uh, 
small city uh, uh, experiments. Uh, is it possible to, to see big ideas happen in government for all the bureaucrats who are surrounding us right now in Washington, D.C.? Are they hopelessly just spinning the wheel? Uh, uh, is, it, is it possible to explore and pursue big ideas uh, in the nonprofit space at think tanks? Uh, or is it really just in the private sector? Uh, so uh, maybe uh, Eli, uh, 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 Tamara, and then I'll come to you and ask you another uh, question, James. Yeah, so I, I, I came from the think tank world, obviously, before I was at Boom. And, and so I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of uh, big ideas wherever you are. Uh, and I think absolutely you can add value um, you know, in government, in, in think tanks, and in the private sector. Um, I think that the, the most important thing is, is not just the big ideas. It's executing on them, though, right? Like, it's, it's a bias towards action. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, I just think... You know, for 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 all my friends in think tanks and 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 uh, you know, and, and in government, I would say, like, yeah, you have an idea, and and don't just let it sit there. Actually, you know, do it, or make sure that it gets done, or, or you know, partner with people to get it done, um, because you know, you can write papers all day long, and and um, but ultimately, somebody has to do them, and if you're not willing to be part of that, then then there's a good chance it won't get done. So so um, so absolutely, uh, big ideas matter uh, across the board, but uh, but you need that bias towards action as well. Is it just in these special economic zones that you see promise, or do you see promise uh, in you know big bureaucratic institutions like Congress or like you know an administrative agency? Well, I think uh, as I totally agree with everything you just said, Eli. Um, I'm hoping we find some points of disagreement because I feel like we're being too nice right now. <laughs> but um, generally speaking, you know, part of the stagnation that we're seeing in American government is just looking at the life, cycle, life cycles of any big institutions, right? So we're in this. Everything is aging, right? So like the average age of a university professor and university president going up, the average age of an NIH grantee going up, uh, the average age of a congressman and a senator, both of those are going up. I think aging is an underrated part of the story of why we are where we are, right? Um, as firms get older, as institutions get older, they start to stagnate generally because that's what happens when you get older. Um, so I think one place that we could be looking really specifically is to get more people who have these general big ideas and can execute on them into uh, uh, places where we would like to see this change happen most. Um, I think it's unfortunate that when I think of like the one person who can coordinate a big team of people to do something amazing, it's Elon Musk, and I, and I can't think of many other people after that. Um, so I do think it's possible, um, but I think it requires one, like actually also introducing some competition. Part of the mission of um, so the Center for Innovative Governance Research is to literally inject competition into like the one area that most people wouldn't want to see it, and that's in government. So. Okay, James, you, you made the case uh, in one of your uh, papers, one of your writings, that humanity needs a grand frontier. Uh, so talk to us about what you mean by that and, uh, and why that's important. Uh, right. So, you know, big ideas are nice. I'm a little concerned that, that ideas factories and ideas festivals um, are, are productive of fantasies that, that do not actually square with what is really going on, and that if we actually focus first on what is rather than what if, uh, then the content that we put into that context is going to be much more viable than if we begin sort of somewhere up here um, in the ether and then try to try to pull those things down into the world. Um, so here's an example, and this goes back to, you know, innovation versus stagnation, right? So like, does artificial intelligence that works in a way that we can't explain and that we can't even communicate with to interrogate it about how and why it is working, right? Is that innovative or is it actually stagnating? Is it innovative or is it stagnating to lose 75% of all jobs in 40 years because AI is coming and we're just sort of helpless to do anything about it, right? And the answer, of course, might be both, right? Like, is um, Ocasio-Cortez Correct, when she says, oh, this is great, you guys. Automation is going to be awesome. At long last, uh, the dignity and value of the human being is going to be liberated from labor, right? So no one's going to need to work or really do anything in order to be valued and sort of sustained by the community, right? So, like, there's a vision, right? There's a big idea, which probably many people in this room would say, but wait, 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 no, 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 like, stop the train, right? We, we want to get off that train. Um, but people are starting to think this way. Uh, and then, of course, you have um, our friends on the far left um, who are unabashedly 
transhumanist or posthumanist. I know Catherine Mengu Ward is either in the house now or is going to show up at some point. Um, and you know, I I appreciate the enthusiasm of my libertarian friends who are like, sex, drugs, and robots, like, <laughs> floor it, full speed ahead. Um, but <laughs> couple, couple, couple claps there. Um, but the, yeah, at, at this point, you know, it's clear that there are um, that there are highly motivated, like woke technologists who would like nothing more than to upload their sort of ideological framework into the internet and into AI. Um, you've got Amy Webb and others out there saying we need an international standards agency for AI. Um, to make sure that the bots are not racist or too white. Um, and that's a big idea too, right? And there are probably many people in this room who would also want to like pull the e-brake and have a think about that and why it's happening. Um, those kinds of things, I would argue, um, are tremendously enclosing, right? Um, there is a real interest among some people and I think a growing segment of, of people who think about technology um, who really want to encase the world in this sort of unitary um, uh, system of rule and organization. Uh, you know, what something like Martin Heidegger would describe as framing the world. Uh, and for those of you out there who, who know or read like Nick Land, if that rings a bell for anyone, right? Like Nick Land's like accelerationist thing is like the insane logic of capitalism is that it wants to eat everything and convert everything into a resource, into what Heidegger called like a standing reserve. And so he's afraid that if we go into space, we're just gonna treat planets as mines, basically. And so human civilization is gonna become spacefaring and just like eat planets and mine them for all these rare metals that we need to keep all of our devices going and to live in this like hallucinatory spaceship civilization. Um, I'm not worried about that, but it is a big idea, yes. right? So like we need to be clear that if, if we're going to advance technologically, we've got to do so in a way that is actually serving human beings recognizably with the human nature um, as such. And so how do you do that, right? Yes. Well, you look at Mars and you could treat Mars as just like a big ball of, of rare earth metals or resources. Uh, you can look at Mars as like a treasure chest that we just need to get in there and like pop open. Um, or you can look at Mars, you know, the way Elon Musk does. Um, and I'm glad that he's building some awesome rockets and it's just very beautiful to behold. But, you know, finally we can have direct democracy, you guys, on every issue. Like technology's finally solved all the political problems, they're gone. Like this is a hallucinatory fantasy, right? And it's just not going to work. Um, there is another way though, right? We can look at Mars as something that's been part of our human experience and our perceptions from the very beginning, from our primordial origins, right? Mars has always been there. Uh, cultures through for thousands and thousands of years have had this sort of relationship of reality with Mars. Um, and Mars is really the only planet, at least until we can you know, get to Alpha Centauri in 40 years, whatever. Um, there is this window where Mars is very unique. Uh, it's the it's the only closest approximation to Earth that is available to us, um, or even really imaginable to us, uh, and that puts it in this sort of privileged position in relationship with our planet, with nature, and with our human nature. Um, and approaching Mars in that way sort of opens up the field of human endeavor without like alienating us from our own nature or treating us as some sort of problem that needs to be solved technologically. So if if the big idea is not sex, drugs, and robots, if the big idea is not Green New Deal, breaking up bit tech, Medicare for all, Mars is is an example. What other examples are there that we should be getting excited about, that we should be investing more energy in? Uh, Eli or uh, Tamara? I mean, my answer is charter cities. It's going to be charter cities again and again and again, right? Um, to... And it's so you can think of it in one sense as like a thing we want to do to help jumpstart development in low and middle income countries. But there's no reason why we shouldn't have a charter city in Nebraska, right? Um, if you actually take serious the idea that we can um, compete in governance for people, for resources, um, for all of that, you should take charter cities very seriously, right? So in Nkwashi, that city that we were working with in Zambia, it used to take half a day to get to the airport. And this is, again, uh, should be a 30 minute trip today because they built all the road out. It takes 
40 minutes to get to the airport, right? So um, the fact that they could do this uh, when the government had centuries to do this and didn't um, is pretty amazing. And I think that's the thing that we should be investing tons of resources in. So I, I think there's a lot of them, right? So at Boom, it's it's you know we want to be able to get you anywhere on the planet within four hours for a hundred dollars, right? That's that's what we're driving towards. Um, but but uh, you know aside from that, I think uh, extending the, the the human lifespan, right? Anti-aging research is 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 a big idea that's that's totally worth. Uh, thinking about uh, energy too cheap to meter, which we've heard about already today. Um, that that's a great uh, uh, goal to aspire to, and and then you know expanding out into into space, I think, is another one, right? Um, uh, I'm not sure what that looks like uh, in in the end, but uh, but yeah, absolutely, we should we should be. Um, uh, I, I see. Uh, I see human civilization or, or, or civilization on Earth as just a series of explosions, right? You have the Cambrian explosion, uh, 500 million years ago, and 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 uh, you know mammals uh, suddenly exploding, uh, you know after after the dinosaurs uh, were <laughs> wiped out, uh, and and you have the Industrial Revolution as a, as an explosion, uh, 200 years ago, and and it it really seems to me like uh, you know exploding into the solar system is is uh, what's next. So, James, you know, how do you develop the sense of velocity behind this this notion of going to Mars for all the reasons you explained uh, and the way that AOC has, you know, whipped up a tornado of enthusiasm around the Green New Deal? Well, right. So, you know, I think what we've seen under digital conditions so far, and we're really just getting started, uh, is a lot of people saying like, no, we don't really want to do stuff anymore. Everything's sort of been done. You know, there's not really point in having these big fantasies. Um, why don't we just sort of sit around and tend our little plots of land and um, and rest? You know, why don't we just sort of rest as a civilization for maybe a long time? Uh, and there's, you know, there's sort of a socialist version of this. Um, there's like, you know, a Catholic version of this. I think I can, you know, safely not offend any of my like Catholic conservative political theorist friends by saying many of them would really just like to, you know, to like take it down to the local level and just kind of you go to church and you have your family and the end. Um, so in spite of the fact that I think that's, that's a very strong, like cultural gravitational pull that's developing, um, there are still going to be some pretty clear imperatives for like physically getting up and doing things that might be difficult or challenging or even a little scary. And so, you know, one of these things is um, is just going to be like a military question. Uh, it just is. Um, it's possible that in, in digital conditions like war as we knew it is basically toast. It's not going to be aircraft carriers sailing around and massive tank formations. And like, that's probably not ever going to happen again. Uh, nevertheless, right, like there's space and it's full of satellites and China like does their quantum computing thing and builds their like surface to space laser and like blows a satellite out of space. And now there's this massive smear of like space junk that's like potentially going to kill astronauts and like wreck space stations. And China basically says like, oh, you know, we, <laughs> we definitely won't do that again, right, unless we have to. Um, and so space is going to be militarized. It just is. And we, we've got to figure out some way of facing up to the reality of the fact that humans, even if they're not going to be sort of orbiting Earth in, you know, like fifth element style, like casino spaceships or whatever, we're still going to be projecting massive amounts of power into space. We're already filling the, Earth, the orbit full of satellites. Um, Mars is up there. The moon is up there. Um, and that's going to take on a security component even more strongly than it already has. And so in spite of the fact that under digital conditions, I think many people are really just going to want to just kind of take a big breather and rest, um, th that's not, that's, that's not going to like take these kind of security military questions and push them off to the side. So as nice as it is to say, oh, like this is humanity's next great step into the future and how amazing it is and how grateful we can feel that we're part of like humanity's evolution in this space. Right? That's cool, but you know, but the, the the security question is really going to be one that is is sort of beyond the realm of persuasion. It's going to have this imperative character to it, and I think it's probably going to drive what happens um, on Mars, on the Moon, in space. Mm -hmm. Israel sent a privately funded 
craft to the moon and it just crashed into the moon and it was still for them like this great national achievement that really united Israelis and they got really excited about it. So, you know, they, these are the kinds of things that I think are going to motivate people. Okay. So growing the DOD budget even bigger is a, is a solution. Great. Going to a hundred billion and beyond. Um, okay. So quick question and then we're going to um, open it up to the, uh, to the audience. So James, you, you talked about skepticism of some of the anti-human aspects of technologies. Uh, are there any technologies, you know, or domains in general that you are generally optimistic about? So question for you uh, and sort of just wh where do you see the future going with the technologies that we are either, either seeing now or on the horizon? What is exciting you? Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, you know, artificial intelligence is, is coming and to some degree it's here. Uh, and I'm you know, hopeful and enthusiastic about the prospect of ensuring that these technologies are governed by the people and for the people in the United States of America, uh, rather than the other way around. I think it can be done. I think, you know, that may involve for some of us here, like a scary step toward like actually flexing some state power in a rigorous and partial way. Um, but if we want technology to serve human ends and really conduce to human flourishing, we can't just sit back and say, well, whatever emerges from this black box, right? Like, that's not a winning bet So us. that means nationalizing some of these things, or what does that mean? No, I mean, I think it means that you, you, there's got to be some sort of, like, regulatory framework, and there have to be some lines on the sandbox. Um, otherwise, I mean, you know, Henry Kissinger is stumbling around, like, the halls of the world elite going, like, can anyone explain to me how this works? Anyone. <laughs> And people are like, uh, no, but, you know, but it's happening and it's inevitable. And it's not inevitable. We do not have to sit back and in the name of, of free markets, which are great, or in the name of sort of liberty, which is also great, that does not mean that we have to be super passive and just wait for these sort of robot monsters to emerge out of the soup so and start ruling. Like? Are you confident that the people currently in place are capable of providing that type of framework? Well, I, I mean, I think we have to be, if we're not confident in our ability to do this, then we better get confident because otherwise events are going to overtake us very fast. Okay, Eli? Uh, <clears throat> so I actually think AI is a little bit overrated right now. It's, it's basically, um, you know, machine, as machine learning is basically um, statistics with just a lot of data. Um, so so, I'm, I'm, not so I'm not so scared of AI and, and, and I think, you know, we'll have another AI winter. Um, uh, before too long. Um, obviously, I'm bullish on, on aviation, which is why I'm working on it. So I think, uh, you know, I, I totally think we're at the beginning of the S-curve for technologies that uh, that do something other than just make subsonic flight slightly more cheap, right? So so we're, we're basically building overture with uh, the, the last 50 years of, of technological improvement uh, since Concorde, uh, but that's all been subsonic aviation, right? So we're, we're taking all the stuff from subsonics and applying them to supersonics. Uh, when you actually look at the pipeline of like what could be done once the supersonic market proves itself and, and, and the improvements that, um, that could come along in future generations, it starts to get really exciting. And I would say actually the other thing that I think people are underrating right now is, um, is, is like clean tech um, and, and in particular things like carbon capture. Uh, I think I think people are going to be surprised at how quickly that comes online, uh, based on some you know conversations I've had with other startups and 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 potential partners that we're we're, we're talking to. Um, it's it, it's going to be um, it's going to happen a lot quicker than people think. Tamara. Yeah. Um. To to go back to something Eli said earlier, I think aging is a really interesting frontier for paying attention to it. You have people like Laura Deming at the uh, Longevity Fund who are thinking not only about how to extend our life. Um, but also to compress morbidity, right? So those are two different parts of aging. There's this idea that we could like keep living forever, but you know your body might not work that great. In that case, I don't know that I want to live to 150. But if you can compress morbidity, that's also another um, really interesting part of aging. Looking at nuclear energy is a is another place that I'm bullish about. You people like Mike Schellenberger who are working very hard uh, to bring that online. And so when we talk about the Green New Deal. One of the reasons why I didn't think the Green New Deal was super compelling is that it never talked about one pricing carbon or nuclear energy, and those are two really critical areas. Um, but again, to Eli's point, uh, the 
when we talk about climate change, there's lots of talk about how we're all definitely going to die in um, you know, 12 years. Um, and in that case, if that's true, why would we do anything about that? But when you look at, like, for example, how much carbon is in the air and how we've been able to like pilot technologies that can actually like clean the air, that's that's a pretty um, amazing, amazing feat. And then you look at this will sound stupid, but I think uh, one of the the important uh, elements of fighting car climate change is going to be thinking about how we can switch away from our meat consumption. Uh, and so the fact that like Burger King has piloted the Impossible Burger, and it's such a big deal that it's selling out everywhere, and they're they're uh, having to think about seriously rolling that out. I think that's pretty amazing because we're not like eating people. Peg is like shaking his head at me. <laughs> You'll never have to give up meat. It's fine. Um, but it's pretty amazing like that. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, but the fact that you could have this actual commercial option that's not telling people like you're you're killing the environment you need to stop eating meat but something that people want and enjoy I think is pretty amazing so um, even though I just spent the past 30 minutes saying everything is bad and we're all it, it's terrible I think there are all these really amazing bright spots and then of course with charter cities as well um, that I think is going to be the next thing that lifts 10 billion people out of poverty 10 million excuse me Okay, questions uh, from the audience. So we'll take one in the front, uh, and then we'll go to the back here. Oh, oh sorry. Dave Lonspock, no affiliation. Question about the boom overture. Will that airplane be powered by uh, non-afterburning super cruise type engines, or is the airplane have a afterburner to go Mach 2.2? And also, uh, it's, I know the planes are half the size of Concorde. Uh, Concorde had four engines, and, and, you st and you're still going to use three engines for the overture, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's the plan right now, is, is, is three uh, medium bypass turbofans without afterburners. Uh, that can super cruise, um, and it's basically so. Uh, fascinating thing about jet engines is that they get better. It, there's kind of a Moore's law for jet engines. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's a lot slower than Moore's law for computer chips, um, but it's it, you know, jet engine cores get about a bit more efficient at about a, a rate of uh, half a percent to one percent a year. Um, so. You know, you, you you do 50 years of that since since Concorde uh, uh, first flight, and um, and and you start to get actually meaningful uh, improvements in fuel efficiency. Question in the back. So we started off with uh, Tyler Cowen and, the, and uh, stagnation. Throwing out another Tyler Cowen idea with the complacent class, right? The idea that we've reached a level of abundance and prosperity that maybe we're not willing to take that risk reward trade off anymore because that will disturb. You know, what is largely, at least in this country, uh, a large amount of abundance, and how that affects our pushes in technological change, uh, and maybe even you know, capturing any gains that we get from that stuff towards redistribution as, a tool, as, as opposed to investment. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I think this is a serious problem, um, and uh, in, in, in two ways, right? And the first is we already see this going on with corporations where more and more corporations are really not practicing capitalism in any recognizable way. And they're just turning into these like compliance farms where they don't even know who their own shareholders are. And it's just these entities and they're not, you know, it's not about like individuals amassing funds and then wagering those funds on specific productive outcomes, right? Which is capitalism. And this other sort of weird corporate compliance thing, you know, where the human resources departments like keep growing and it's all just sort of this like, they're turning into these weird city states that it's, it's a problem. And it's also an attempt, I think, to, to escape from risk and to disappear into this sort of precautionary principle utopia that isn't sustainable, right? It, um, it's not clear how an economy can actually work long term on that basis. And so there's this weird kind of like hoarding effect that you see where you have these very wealthy institutions, you know, and, and we can pile like universities into this too, right? Like they're, and they're just keep pumping out the graduates and like, what are they doing? And like, well, we don't know, you know, maybe they're just going to like churn out more weirdly recondite doctrines that, you know, that they learned from their professors of like some infinitesimally small, like critical studies department, right? Um, and I think that does have a clear impact on the way we approach technology uh, and the way that we start thinking of technology as something that can, you know, that, that, that can free us from the need to risk, right? From the discomfort of risking. What if something goes wrong, right? Well, something's going to go wrong if you just go down that tunnel headlong. I don't think there's very much cheese down there. But 
I do think the question is like, how did we get here? And I think aging is a pretty underrated part of the story, right? So university administrators get paid $250,000 to, I'm not really sure what it is they get paid for, and that keeps growing. Uh, sorry if any of you are university administrators. Um, <laughs> I am not, sorry. <laughs> and then you have, I mean, this is like at every level, like part of what we, we joke about this, but if we were to have an America program, part of what we would be doing is waging like light generational warfare, um, because it's in everything. It's in our housing market. You have boomers who are sitting on their housing rents that they've gotten, um, and they like won't move, but they're frustrated that they can't sell their homes because nobody my age can afford them. Um, you have uh, government, and every level of government, you have staffs filled with people who really don't know what they're working on. You have people like Rand Paul's office who refuse to staff their offices competently and pretend they're like getting money back to the taxpayers when it's really just going back to the treasury. Um, and aging is, affects incumbent firms, right? You have less firm entry and exit. Uh, you have firms that exist that are getting just bigger and bigger, and they're less able to innovate. And so part of the story at every level really is just like our institutions are aging, the people in them are aging, and um, Decline very much is a choice, but it can also become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So it's a bad thing that 40% of Americans, almost 50%, according to Pew, say that America is in decline. Um, but when you look around, right, we have two states that are currently at replacement rate fertility, Utah and South Dakota. It's hard not to sort of uh, accept this narrative of decline. But so literally everything is aging. And Tyler also writes about this. And that's, I think, part of the story about why we are where we are. So uh, uh, if I could just chime in. Oh, so, so I was Tyler's student, so if, of course Tyler was right. Um, and and uh, you know, the, in the complacent class. Um, but I think there's actually a spectrum of complacency if you look across countries, which is really interesting. So, so in, in the U.S. is probably in the middle. Uh, and you, yeah, I see. I think like of China is like very like non-complacent. Uh, they can actually uh, make decisions, sort of as a society, and, and get things done, and they don't let their nimbies. Um, slow things down um, and 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 the US is in the middle and you can guess who's on the on the low end but I won't say because we might have customers there um, <laughs> and and then and then if you and then if you to tie it into fertility you can actually I so, so China does have a, fer a fertility problem. So, so it doesn't line up perfectly. But I do, I do think that um, there is certainly a, an interesting correlation between uh, you know fertility rates and and the levels of complacency that we're seeing uh, around the world. All right. Final question in the back. Hi there. Uh, thanks for a great panel. Um, so many of us in this room have been working against what we're seeing growing in DC, like a tech clash, uh, and you know. It seems to be like a, a creeping idea that many of the technological innovations we've had over the last 15, 20 years especially have maybe not been a net positive. And that may lead to a lot of burdensome regulations and really attacking like te the technology sector as an industry. So uh, to what extent do we think this is necessarily coming from the public? As you know, one thing I'm worried about is it's actually more coming from entrenched industries, including the media itself. Uh, and if that's the case, what can, what can we do about it? I think this is really interesting. I don't think I've met anybody who hates tech as much as tech journalists, right? Like so many of them <laughs> seem to absolutely hate their subject. And part of it, what you can think of, if I'm being not charitable, is you know they, these are all people who went to the same schools, who got the same educations, and you have some of them which are like working to build things, and you have some of them which are writing about the people who are working to build things. Um, so I think it's really interesting to separate this out, right? So everybody hates Facebook, but like everybody's still using Facebook. Um, and so I think uh, I don't have anything super, super enlightening to say, except to say that I do find this really curious that so much of our tech lash happens to be like reporters writing, latching on to something and running with it. Um, and you can think of these as like a system of incentives. It pays really well, for example, to talk about Theranos without noting that Theranos was almost entirely an invention of the media, right? She got Elizabeth Holmes got no money from any major VCs. The one that she got from was like a personal connection. Uh, and then you had her board was staffed with literally Henry Kissinger. Um, and, and I think that's pretty important to point out, right? So you have a bunch of journalists who talk all day about Theranos, who are consuming every piece of Theranos commentary, but that's not what people who are actually building things are doing. So I think that's worth pointing out. You know, once upon a time, um, television was invented. And you know, people in that sort of H.G. Wells tradition of like, oh, at last we will have one world government and it'll be very peaceful, right? The television was the way of doing like mass mind control, right? Like you get the right memes, you have ethical memes, you pump them out to people, you got three television stations, and that's how you sort of organize society. Uh, and well, it didn't work very well, right? Like, oh, the people are going crazy when they watch television. They're like giving into hallucinations, 
then like they're doing KGB acid and like all these terrible things are going on. Um, and it's the 60s and it's the 70s, it's a violent hallucinatory time, like read your J.G. Ballard, like this is what it was. Um, and so like what do these hippies do? They, they get rich and they say, well, uh, we'll just, we'll fix television with better technological innovation and we'll democratize television, right? And it'll be social media, and everyone will be drawn together in the spirit of harmony and everyone can be friends with everyone on the planet. It's gonna be awesome, you know, finally we made it. And of course, like, no, it doesn't really work that way. Um, as Marshall McLuhan said about the global village, like it's not a friendly place. People are chafing up against each other, at, like, angry, hot, crowded, you know, to steal some, some Tom Freeman language, but we can, we can stop doing that for the rest of the, the day, I hope. Um, okay, so now you have these like wealthy hippies who are shocked, shocked that social media is like not bringing utopia to, to the world, right? Which I think is just like not, that's not a message that people need to be hearing from these folks, I don't think. Uh, and it's really, you know, I think just a caricature and absurd to say that these evil tech geniuses are hacking our minds and they're capturing our attentions. And it's like, people, I don't know, my view is closer to like, nobody's using Facebook, they know that it's really boring, <laughs> they're getting tired of scrolling, and Zuckerberg recognizes this, and he's like, you know what, we're just going private chat, you guys, like, I'm done. I'm done, like, <laughs> arguing with the media, I'm done sort of like trying to censor snuff films that you guys are posting, we're just going into the private chat. And sure enough, these same, like, frustrated, Aquarian, rich hippies who wanted to save the world with social media are starting to panic now because they think that the private chat is gonna destroy democracy, right? <laughs> Bolsonaro was elected in Brazil because fake news flooded WeChat. We can't trust human beings to correspond with each other privately on the internet. <laughs> if you think democracy is being killed by the private chat, you, maybe you should rethink your experience of democracy. And, and if I can have five seconds, I'll just say tech lash. Uh, ignore it, go do stuff that matters in the world of atoms instead of bits. Yes. Join me in thanking the panel for a great conversation. Thank you very much. Do we have microphones for the next panel or should they? Okay, perfect.